you'll bear me witness that we've been sharing pretty well every meeting uh, some happenings out of the revival and I want to do that again tonight before we have a time of sharing in the Winnipeg Crusade back in December beginning in December of 1971 we began on a Tuesday night with three days notice uh, no churches cooperating uh, we rented a church seating 12 or 1400 a place called Elam Chapel and I remember the first meeting we had one of the brethren in a little prayer service we had prior to the meeting he said brethren if we have 60 people out there tonight we'll be lucky well we had 600 that night and by Friday 900 and by Sunday we were full we stayed there for 17 days and then recessed for Christmas and came back in a larger church in the new year and stayed there for three weeks. And God did many wonderful things. But while we were in Elam Chapel before Christmas, Dr. Sherwood Wirt, who is the editor of Billy Graham's paper, the decision paper, uh, through Leonard Ravenhill, who was a personal friend of his, heard about revival in Canada and hopped a plane, came down to Winnipeg. And he let us know he was coming. We had never met him. Uh, and... He was there that night. The place was packed. And there was a very, very heavy response at the end. We had the choir loft full of people that had come forward. The platform was a large platform loaded with people. The altar of the church. The first We had to keep moving people out of pews till we had the first three pews clean across the church. And Mr. Wirt, he was in the front pew, so he had to keep moving back. Afterwards, he came up and introduced himself. And uh, he said... Uh, he said, uh, Bill, this is wonderful. This is just one. He said, you know, our organization desperately needs a revival. And then he said, uh, he paused for a moment. Then he said, my wife desperately needs a revival. Then after a long struggling pause, he said, you know what? And I need a revival. Well, before I could um, talk to him, somebody came and said, you're needed in the counseling room. And so I had to leave him standing there. We had an afterglow that night, and he was there with a notebook and a tape recorder taking down, you know, what was going on. And uh, then he had to leave on a plane the next morning, so I didn't get to see him really, to talk to him after that. But God really touched his heart, and he, I have a, a half-hour tape that in my possession, which he sent to me in the mail, which was his personal testimony. And he told us uh, how that, he, w he said, I would have divorced my wife. 20 years ago, but I didn't want to hurt Billy Graham. And uh, there was no compatibility between he and his wife at all. And um, he'd always blamed her. He said she was just, you, you couldn't talk to her, you couldn't do anything with her, and he'd always blamed her. But God showed him that the fault was his. And so he experienced renewal, and he's written a book it's called The Afterglow. I would suggest you try and get it. It'll bless your soul every chapter. He spells out very clearly what happened in his life, in his wife, through the revival up here in, in Canada. And uh, it's, it's, in some ways it's rather amusing because after God renewed him, uh, he offered to help his wife with the dishes one night and she said, what happened? What's wrong with you? You know, she looked at what's wrong with you. And then when he offered to take out the garbage, she said, you know, what, you going crazy or something? You know? And it's all there. And finally he got her to an afterglow, and she complained about the seats being hard, and why did the prayers have to be so long, and all this stuff. And finally she said, well, I'm going to hit the chair. Now, the hit, hitting the chair is a kind of a phrase. <laughs> you have people sitting in a circle and a chair in the middle with a rug there. And people who want to be prayed for will hit the chair. I mean, they'll get up and walk and kneel at the chair. And if it's a woman, ladies will come and kneel with. If it's a man, men will come. And you'll counsel with the person in front of the whole group and lead them in the steps of renewal. And so she hit the chair. And God renewed her. I was in the crusade in Edmonton. He phoned me long distance. He was so excited he could hardly talk. He said, my wife got renewed. Guess what? My wife got renewed. My wife, my, our home was like heaven. And she's traveled with him in... Uh, Afterglow work. They've had afterglows in churches all across America pretty well. He was asked a couple of years ago to go to Korea when uh, Billy Graham was in Korea. He was supposed to go to, to, uh, to speak to preachers, and of course there were hundreds. He said we had, they had some meetings where there were probably 1,500 preachers or more there. And he said, you know, Bill, I left all my sermons at home. 
All it took was my Bible, and all I taught them was Galatians 2.20, what I learned in the Canadian Revival. And uh, so God revolutionized his life. Uh, I was in Minneapolis in the crusade, and Mr. Ward got me to speak to the headquarters staff there. They, they have about 400 in the one building and 50 in another. They closed the place down so I could have a chapel there, so I could talk to them, and I brought a revival message and gave an invitation. There were 25 or 30 came forward. One lady got saved, had never been a Christian, and others got renewed. There were two or three involved in the occult we had to deal with, including a lady who was employed by the organization who was involved in the area of counseling, of all things, but she was involved rather deeply in the occult, and God blessed her. And after we'd finished all the counseling, an older gentleman came up, and he was dressed in, uh, in work clothes, sort of, and he, he said, I'm one of the custodians. And he said, I was in that meeting. And he said, God spoke to my heart in a powerful way. He said, and I went back down. He said, I can't sweep a floor. I can't push a mop. All I can do is stand there and shake. He said, I need to be counseled with. And so we counseled with him. And uh, God touched his heart, too. Mr. Wirt and I were, I was in a, uh, several crusades in Minneapolis, actually, since 1971. And... Um, well, in one case, Mr. Work was running the afterglow with me, and he had a brand new, beautiful buckskin jacket with a sheepskin lining, brand new. I don't know what the thing cost him. And uh, that night, we had uh, well, a good number of people there and a chair in the middle. We had everything but the rug. We no nowhere for anybody to kneel. So you know what happened? He took off this beautiful new jacket of his, laid it on the floor, and the people knelt on his jacket that night when they went to the chair in the afterglow. By the way, who, who in this meeting has ever been in an afterglow? Nobody has. We should have one before I leave. At least one, maybe Sunday night, after the service in the evening. All right, let's think about it. Let's have an afterglow. <laughs> All right? I'll tell you what we'll do. We'll pray about it. And um, we don't have afterglows just for the sake of having them. They've been greatly used of God. Uh, could I give you 40 minutes of an afterglow in about three minutes or whatever, you know? Uh a school teacher got up a man in the afterglow. There was about 60, 70 people there. And he said, uh, I am a Christian, but my life is uh, real phony. He said, I say, I sing, my Jesus, I love thee, but I don't think I really love him, he said, because I never talk about him. If I loved him, I'd talk about him. He said, I need prayer. So he came to the chair, and some men came and counseled. I was monitoring the thing, but I just sat over at the side, and these men came and counseled and prayed with him. And he got to his feet, and you could see by the look on his face, uh, the Lord had touched his life. He went back to his chair, and immediately another fellow popped up, and he said, well, I'm a school teacher too. And he said, if that man's a phony, he said, I'm a worse phony. He said, I know him, and I'm worse than he is. He said, I need prayer too. And his wife shut up beside him, and she said, well, I'm just like my husband. She said, I'm cold and empty. And so the two of them, we put a second chair out, and men and women came and knelt and counseled with them. And uh, then they two sat down. And then a the lady, we found out later on she was a psychiatrist, uh, we didn't know her. I'd never seen her before because there were people from different churches in the meetings. And uh, she said, well, I've got a problem. I'd like to be prayed for. And we said, what's your problem? She said, well, there's some people I can't like. And I know you're supposed to like everybody. And I just some people I just can't like. So somebody in the group said, are you a Christian? Oh, yes, she said. So somebody said, on what do you base your Christianity? Well, she said, I've, I've always done a lot of good things over the years. So then, of course, the group knew she wasn't born again. And, you know, they led her to Christ. They got talking to her. The group did. I didn't have to do a thing. Just sat there. And people talked to her. And finally she came and knelt at the chair. And some ladies came and knelt with her. And she gave her heart to God. Then she went and sat down. And then there was a man sitting in the circle. He wasn't fa sitting far from me. And I didn't, I didn't know who he was. Uh, he was a backslidden evangelist. A man who about 15 years ago backslid. Went right to the bottom of the pile. As far down as a man could go. And he was in the meeting that night. And his wife was sitting about five down from him. And why they weren't sitting together, I don't know. But at this point, she got up and she came and stood in front of her husband. And in front of the whole group, she said to her husband, she said, Honey, I've often thought that the reason you backslid years ago was because I was not a very understanding wife. She said, I, I didn't really love you the way I should have. I didn't uh, appreciate you. I didn't encourage you. And she said, I really think I'm to blame. And she said, Martin, could you forgive me? And he just burst. He just broke. And he got to his feet and he, and he staggered over and fell on one of the chairs and she got down beside him and the two of them were just renewed. God touched their lives. That was about 40 minutes in an afterglow. And uh, so it goes. And some nights these afterglows went on until 2 o'clock, 3 o'clock, even as late as 6 o'clock in the morning as the Spirit of God was talking to people, could be preachers, missionaries, evangelists, Sunday school teachers and all kinds of people uh, from the top to the bottom. And oftentimes, we used to have a saying, 
But you know, the hardest nuts, they wait for the last. And sometimes at four o'clock in the morning, the, the circle would be narrowed down to 12 people. Maybe we started with 250. We're down to 12 now, and in that circle is one guy. He's really tough, and he just is struggling and fighting and everything else. And finally, at the very end, he'll say, look, I need prayer. Remember a pastor, pastor of a church, seating 1,400 people. He was a tough one one night, just sat there, and right to the very end, about 10 or 12 people left, and he asked for prayer. Well, so much for the afterglows. John chapter 7, if you have a testament or Bible with you. And thank you all for sharing. Each evening there will be an opportunity for sharing. John seven thirty seven. In the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried, saying, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He that believes on me, as the scripture has said. Now, Jesus is not quoting here from any particular specific scripture. He's giving us the sum total of the teaching of numerous scriptures in the Old Testament. He that believes on me, as the scripture has said, out of his innermost being shall flow rivers of living water. But this he spoke of the Spirit, which they that believe on him should receive. For the Holy Spirit was not yet given because the Jesus was not yet glorified. The uh, title I'd like to give to my message tonight is A Tragic Discrepancy. I hope that um, you are praying that God will lay on my heart the message I should bring. You know, it's an awful feeling sometimes an hour or less before the service. You have three or four sermons running through your mind. You're not sure which one you ought to bring. Now, normally it's quite clear, but not always. And that's an awful feeling for a preacher. Oh, it's, isn't it terrible? Sitting here and you've got three sermons running through your mind. You know, if one duck flies over, you know what to do. You shoot that duck, but if 16 fly over, that's, that's hard. A tragic discrepancy. And the tragic discrepancy is the discrepancy between the ideal that we find outlined in the scripture and the actual, which is where I live. Now, ladies, if you were to go to a store and uh, pay for a rug, let's say 12 by 14, you pay cash for it, it's to be delivered, it's delivered to the house, and when it's unrolled, you find it is 6 by 8. Now, there's a discrepancy in the rug size. You paid for something much larger. Would you have to ask your pastor's advice as to what to do about it? I don't think so. You know what to do about it. Uh, you'd uh, write a letter or you'd phone or you'd go and see the person response and say, look, I paid for this and I only got this. Why is there this, this discrepancy in size? Or supposing then you were going to buy a car and you had a friend who sold cars and you told him, look, I want to get a car that will get me at least 20 miles to gallon on the highway and the friend said, look, I've got exactly the car you want. People tell me they're getting 24, 25 miles a gallon, so exactly what you want. So in the strength of this friend of yours, his recommendation, you buy the car and discover you have a gas gobbler, like I heard a fellow say one time, every time the motor of my car turns over, it says 25 cents, 25 cents, 25 cents. So what are you going to do about it? You wouldn't need me to tell you what to do. You would have words with your friend. See, look, this clunker only gets 7 miles a gallon. What are you telling me, 24 miles a gallon? Now, you were not honest. Because there is a discrepancy between what you were promised and what you're actually realizing. You know what to do. Or if you worked for somebody and they owed you $200 and they said, look, I'll send you a check in the mail, and the check came sure enough, and the check was made up for $50, there's a, there's a discrepancy now of $150. Well, you need to ask your pastor or me or somebody else what to do? Of course not. You know what to do. You write a letter, get on the telephone, go and see the person as the case might be. Because there's a discrepancy that you want to explain. You want that other $150. We don't have to be told what to do. We know what to do. And the thing is this, you know, when it comes to a material matter, we know exactly what to do if there's a discrepancy of the kind that I've just been describing. But there can be a discrepancy between what God has promised in the Scriptures and what I am actually experiencing, and it can be there for 45 years, and I never ask a question. And it's a tragic thing because if my life is not really filled with God's Spirit in a New Testament sense, 
and measure. It's a tragic thing then because of the good I might do if my life was really filled with God's Spirit and because of the evil that I sometimes unwittingly do because my life is not controlled by the Spirit of God. A tragic discrepancy. So then, what I want to do tonight is this. I want us to look together at the Word of God and see what the Lord really promised. And as we do this, I want to put each one of us in our hearts sort of line our life up with what God is saying in the Bible. One of the first meetings here, I think I said that revival was my experience catching up to my theology. But sometimes my experience never does. Another definition of revival is this. Revival is a Christian coming up to a New Testament level or standard. That's all it is. But you see, we've been subnormal for so long that when the normal comes along, we think it's something abnormal. All right. God gave us some marvelous promises regarding what we might call the abundant life or the overflowing life, the victorious Christian life. And here's one. And they go, it says, from strength to strength. Are you a stronger Christian now than you were a year back? Or can you think back to, you know, the days when you first found Christ as your personal Savior? Could you honestly say you are a stronger Christian tonight than you were then? But the Bible says you ought to be. They go from strength to strength. And it must mean from strength at this level to strength at that level. Here's another one, Proverbs chapter 4. It says, The path of the just is as the shining light that shines more and more unto the perfect day. The perfect day is that day when I pass over to be with God, or in the larger sense, when Jesus Christ returns. But the path of the just is supposed to be more and more light on life's pathway. Is there? Do I have more light, spiritually speaking, now than I had a year ago or five or ten years back? What are the facts in regard to this matter? Or John chapter 1 where it says, talking about my relationship to Jesus Christ, it says, of, the Greek there means out of, ek, out of his fullness, we have all received and grace for grace. New grace in the place of old grace. Today's grace in the place of yesterday's grace. You remember that the manna that came down from heaven every day, it bred worms and stank if it was kept overnight. Some people are trying to live on an experience that happened, you know, some while ago. What happened today? Did I have fellowship with my Savior today? Did Jesus Christ, does he walk and talk with me every day? Well, he wants to. And so out of his fullness we have all received and grace for grace. Grace is poured into thy lips was the way the prophecy ran of Jesus in Psalm 45. And that grace is available to us, directed toward us. The Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory. The glory is of the only begotten of the Father, full of what? Full of grace and full of truth. And of His fullness we have all received in grace for grace. Do you know more of the grace of God now than you knew a year back, six months ago, or two or three years ago? Do you, do you really? Now there's the ideal that God has given us in the Bible, and the actual is where I really live. And then... In John chapter 8, the Lord Jesus Christ said, If the Son, talking about himself, If the Son therefore shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. Free indeed. Oh, we had a beautiful experience of that one night. A pastor came for counseling out in western Canada, and uh, he said, You know, I, uh, I really think I've got a demon. I have such an awful problem. And he told us about it, and we checked this out. He did not have this kind of a problem at all. And I said, my dear brother, in the book of James, chapter 1, it says, every man is tempted when he's drawn away of his own lust. And I said, you're going to have to recognize this fact that it's a self problem. It's a lust problem uh, just rising from self. He had not been walking in the Spirit. So he accepted that and we went to prayer and he asked God to forgive him. And he was praying and, you know, his, his body began to move back and forth. I thought he was going to just sort of break in two or something. He didn't really. He told us afterwards, he said, you know, when I was praying, the Lord gave me the prayer. He said, it was just not my prayer at all. And, you know, in the middle of this, this intense prayer of his, he started to laugh. You could just about hear the chains go clunk on the floor. He was free. He was totally free. And he cried and he laughed and he thanked God for giving him the gift of repentance. It's called that in the Bible, these two places, Acts 5. And in 2 Timothy chapter 2, the gift of repentance. 
and all. It was just so great. So the next night, he gave his testimony. Now, we never encourage people that are struggling in certain areas to share, you know, any intimate details of what went on in their life before God set them free. He didn't do that. He just said, people, I've been struggling with an awful problem. And he said, last night, Jesus Christ set me absolutely free. And I want to sing my testimony, and you'll never guess the song he chose. He chose the song, Oh, happy day that fixed my choice on thee, my Savior, and my God. Well, may this glowing heart rejoice and tell its raptures all abroad. He hadn't been singing more than two lines before that. We were in a building seating a thousand. The whole crowd was crying. My head was on the pew in front. I was sitting down here, and I was just crying. I couldn't help it. You know, if you shut your eyes, you, could, you, you would have thought it was an angel let down from heaven on a golden cord. It was not a natural thing at all. I talked to the pastor of that particular church afterwards, an older man. I said, did you ever hear singing like that? And he said, never in all my life. He said, that man was singing under the unction and power of the Spirit of God. You know, finally he was overcome and he began to cry. Then he stopped and he said, I'm going to finish the song. And you know, he got to this place, Now rest my long divided heart, fixed on this blissful center, rest nor ever from my Lord depart, with him of every good possessed. I'll never forget as long as I live. You know, afterwards I was congratulating myself because up in the balcony I had a fellow taping everything and that night it said, now look, I want you to tape everything that goes on tonight. Not knowing this fellow was going to sing, you see. So afterwards I went to talk to the fellow doing the taping and I said, I hope you got everything tonight. Everything? He said, I just got your sermon. Oh, I said, don't tell me that. Don't tell me that. Don't you remember I said everything tonight? Did you really, sir? I thought you said just the sermon. And so I began complaining to the Lord, and the Lord said, Speak no more to me about this matter. And I lasted about a half an hour and started grumbling again, because I thought, wouldn't it be wonderful to have that on a tape? I could take it all over the country and play it, and Christians could hear and be blessed the way we were blessed that night. I began grumbling, and the Lord said, Now, he said, I want you to get down on your knees and thank me from your heart that you didn't get it on tape. It was too sacred. It was meant only for this crowd this night. So I get down and struggle a bit, and I said, Okay, God, praise the Lord, I never got it on tape. And everything was settled. But the Lord set him free. Jesus Christ said, If the Son therefore shall make you free, you shall be free. What? Indeed. Are you? If you're not, why not ask the question, why? In John chapter 10, verse 10, the Lord Jesus Christ said, The thief comes to kill, steal, and destroy. He said, I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. And that really means an overflowing life. Now, if I don't have it, why don't I have it? Why don't I ask the question and find out why I don't have this overflowing life that the Word of God talks about? Well, Romans chapter 1, it says, uh, verse 16, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. And then he says this, for therein, that is in the gospel, therein is revealed the righteousness of God from faith to faith. Is your faith growing? Is it stronger now than it used to be? And you know, to sort of... I sum it up, 2 Corinthians 3.18, it says, But we all with open face, it means no veil hanging on our face like Moses had, but we all with unveiled face, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. One glorious experience with God the Holy Spirit after another, who is transforming and changing me into the likeness of Jesus Christ. Now that's the normal Christian life. And anything less than that is subnormal. And I need to ask the question, why, if my life is not what it ought to be? By the way, what do you do with Romans 14, 17, 18, where the Apostle Paul says, The kingdom of God is righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. For he that in these things serves Christ is acceptable to God and approved of men. Some people think that you have to have all the sinners mad at you or you're not living a Christian life. That's not so. It says you'll be approved of men. The common people heard Christ gladly. It was normally the religious leaders, political leaders and so on, that were opposed to the message of Jesus Christ. Oh yes, sometimes ordinary common people will hate it too. I understand that. All that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution, but it doesn't say that everybody's going to persecute you. A lot of people are going to be impressed. Why many even of the chief of Asia were Paul's friends, the Word of God says. 
They were his friends. All right. The kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. For he that in these things serves Christ is acceptable to God and approved of men. Now, sometimes people come and they'll say, um, you know, preacher, you're always talking about joy and peace in the Christian life, but you know it's not that way. You know, there's a lot of problems and a lot of trouble, and you know it's not that way. And you shouldn't really be telling people that because that's not true. I think of Billy Bray, that Cornish miner become preacher, a uh, very, very happy person filled with God's Spirit and people. He, he said, people say, well, Billy, haven't you ever had any vinegar? Oh, yes. He said, I've had vinegar as well as honey, but I've had the vinegar with a teaspoon and I've had the honey with a ladle. Romans 15, 13 says this. It's a sort of a prayer of Paul's. It says, Now the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that you may abound in hope through the power of the Holy Spirit. What do I do with a verse like that? Was Paul just sort of throwing out a, kind of a blank and, you know, comforting words that don't really mean anything? The God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing. There's faith that you may abound in hope through the power of the Holy Spirit, what does it mean? Or 1 Peter 1.8, it's talking about my relationship to Christ, whom having not seen you love, in whom though now you see him not yet believing, you rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory. Is that the normal Christian life? Well, really, people, that's what the Bible's saying. Let's look for a few moments, shall we, some promises about the Holy Spirit. And first of all, I have to clear away a misapprehension that many Christians have. Often you'll hear it said, the Holy Spirit doesn't talk about himself. And then they'll quote from John 16 where Jesus Christ said, he shall not speak of himself. But dear people, it does not mean that the Holy Spirit will not talk about himself. Because the next statement is, whatsoever he shall hear. That shall he speak. And the word of that really means he shall not speak out of himself. But whatever he hears, he'll speak. And that's what Jesus Christ said about himself in John chapter 12. He said, I have not spoken of myself. He didn't mean I haven't spoken about myself because he had. He said, I am the bread of life. I am the resurrection and the life. I am this. I am that. He said many things about himself. And so did the Holy Spirit. While there are 19 references to the Holy Spirit in Romans chapter 8, there are almost 60 in the book of Acts. Obviously, the Holy Spirit frequently talks about himself. But he does not talk of himself, out of himself, nor did Jesus. Because when Jesus Christ said, I have not spoken of myself, he said, but the Father who sent me, he gave me a commandment, what I should say and what I should speak. So both Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit, they simply reported those things that God the Father gave them to tell. That's the meaning of it. But in John 16, it does say, Jesus Christ said, he'll glorify me. And the Holy Spirit, while he may talk about himself, he will glorify Jesus Christ. That's his work. A preacher came in one time and he said, uh, all these people are saying you're filled with the Holy Spirit in the meetings, he said. There isn't one place in the Bible where anybody ever said, I am filled with the Holy Spirit. And the Lord flashed a thought into my mind from the book of Micah. And all I did was quote it. Micah the prophet said, But truly I am full of power by the Spirit of the Lord, and of judgment and of might to declare unto Jacob his transgression, and unto Israel his sin. Moreover, I said to my preacher friend, there is not one place in the Bible, in the entire Bible, where anybody ever said, I am saved. Am I to conclude from that that nobody's ever to say I'm saved? Well, he saw the hopelessness of that. I mean, he said it himself that he was saved. You see, we have so many examples of people being saved in the Bible and so many examples of people being filled with the Holy Spirit. Well, promises about the Holy Spirit, there are many of them in the Bible. Here's one. Proverbs 1.23, the Lord says, You turn at my reproof. Behold, I will pour out my Spirit unto you. I'll make known my words unto you. And God is saying, If I will turn from my sins, then he will pour out his Spirit to me. And his word will come alive in my soul. Strange thing. We've even heard people say that the hymn book came alive. I was in a cruci uh, not really a crusade, but in a seminary in the States one time. We had uh, two sessions a day for four days. And uh, the one night there was a singing group, contemporary musical Christian singing group there. And uh, 
the leader of the group came forward, and I had a fellow with me from Winnipeg, and he counseled with this particular young man. He came to me after. He said, man, I couldn't get anywhere with him, he said. I couldn't do a thing with him. All he did was argue. He said, the clothes you people wear make me look like a tramp. And the way you got your hair cut, and the way you've got this done, and, and the songs you sang tonight are so old-fashioned and, and dull and dead, he says, I just, just feel like a fish out of water out here. And finally, he got up off his knees and he left the building. And Harry Keeson said, boy, I don't know what's wrong with him. I don't even know why he came forward. But you know, he was back, that was Monday night. He was back Thursday night. This time he came forward, and this time the Lord got a hold of his heart. And Harry counseled with him again, and this, he said, this man just poured out his heart. Although he was a professing Christian and singing around the country, he had all kinds of problems in his life. And then Harry said, you know, the first thing he said after his life was renewed, he said, my, you're beautiful people. And he says, you know, those songs, I said, there's something about them. They really hit you, don't they? Now, the songs hadn't changed and we hadn't changed, but he had. And God said, if you turn at my reproof, I'll pour out my spirit unto you. I'll make known my words unto you. There's a promise. Here's another one. Isaiah 44, 3 and 4. The Lord said, I will pour water upon him that is thirsty and floods upon the dry ground. I will pour my spirit upon your children, upon your seed, and my blessing on your offspring. You know what Christian parents say to me whose, par whose children are straying all over the country? They'll say, well, God did his part, but my kids didn't respond. So then I say, all right, what does the next verse say? The next verse says, and they shall spring up as among the grass, as willows by the water course. If you are a Christian parent and you've got one child straying, don't you let the devil have that child. There is no reason why the devil should have one child belonging to a Christian believer. If my life is right, I can believe God for my children. All right? It's a promise of God. Isaiah 44, 3 and 4. There it is. I will pour water upon him that's thirsty and floods upon the dry ground. I will pour my spirit upon your seed and my blessing on your offspring and they shall spring up as among the grass as willows by the water course. And we know people that have laid hold of promises like that and seen their whole family come to God in a week. They really got excited about it when they saw what God was promising and they began to plead the promises back to God, and he began to work. All right, that's a promise about the Holy Spirit. And there's one in Zechariah chapter 10, verse 1. It says, Ask you of the Lord rain in the time of the latter rain. When is the time of the latter rain? There's a verse in Proverbs that explains it. It says, The king's favor is like a cloud of the latter rain. The favor of the king. When you're walking in the favor of the king, walking in fellowship with Jesus Christ, then there's a cloud of blessing just waiting to break on your head constantly. Ask you of the Lord rain in the time of the latter rain, so the Lord shall make bright clouds and give them showers of rain to every one grass in the field. Do you have a luscious crop of green grass growing in the field of your life, or is it dry and drought-ridden, empty? Well, here's what God is promising. That's what we're looking at in the Bible and then you come to the New Testament, you have Luke eleven thirteen, where the Lord Jesus Christ said, If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask him? Now, some people have managed to dispensationalize that promise away. If it doesn't belong for today, I wonder why it's in the Bible personally. It's a promise I think we can take today. Many people have and found that it really is so. Or this promise here in John chapter 7, where Jesus Christ said, He that believes on me, He didn't say the apostles or, you know, preachers. He just said, He that believes on me, as the scripture has said, out of his innermost being shall flow rivers of living water. But this he spoke of the Spirit which they that believe on him should receive. Now, are there rivers of living water flowing out from your life? Is your life really a blessing? Many, many Christians have told us mournfully, sadly, but honestly, my life is not a blessing. So what are we going to do with John seven thirty eight and 9? There's a discrepancy here, dear people. We need to face up to it. Many people have and have entered into a new walk with God, a walk where the blessings are there, just like the Lord promised. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, it talks about the Old Testament system, and, and Paul says that there was glory there. 
There was glory there. But he said it was done away. And he says if the ministration of condemnation was glorious, oh, how much rather is the ministration of the Holy Spirit glorious? And that's what we have today. We have the ministration of the Holy Spirit of God. And it's a glorious thing, not a dead thing or a dry thing. All right, those are promises then about the Holy Spirit. What are we going to do with the book of Acts? That's a challenge to my heart. It's a historical record of what happened in the early days of the church. All right, the first 15 chapters of the Bible, there are 50 references of that book, rather, there are 50 references to the Holy Spirit. Some of those chapters have five and six references to the Spirit of God. And when you look at the book of Acts, what do you find? You find that Jews, when they believed on Jesus Christ, they were filled with the Spirit of God. When Gentiles believed, they were filled with the Spirit of God. Acts chapter 2, Acts chapter 4, Acts chapter 10, Acts chapter 19. When Samaritans were believed on Jesus Christ, they were filled with the Spirit of God. And whether a person was, a, let's say, an apostle, or a prophet, or an evangelist, or a pastor, or a teacher... Or whoever he was, if he was a believer, he was filled with the Spirit of God. If he was a man, he was filled. If he was a woman, he was filled. It didn't seem to matter who. As a matter of fact, in the book of Acts, if you were a Christian not filled with the Holy Spirit, brother, you didn't belong, like Ananias and Sapphira. They had agreed together to tempt the Spirit of God. And Paul, or Peter rather, said, Why has Satan filled your heart? Their heart was not filled with the Holy Spirit. They were filled with Satan's power. Now, here's a text for that book, Acts 13, 52. It says, And the disciples were filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit. It doesn't say somewhere. It says simply, And the disciples were filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit. Now, that's the testimony of the book of Acts. Now, what am I going to do with that today? Some people do some very fancy theological footwork, you know, to get away from the obvious implications of texts like this in the Word of God because they realize they're not living up to it and they say to themselves, well, you know, it must be that God really doesn't intend that for today. And people come up with some very, very strange reasons as to why they're not walking in the Spirit or not filled with the Spirit of God. And just because some people may have made some outlandish claims which are not supported by the Word of God, respecting the Holy Spirit, is no reason for me to throw the baby out with the bathwater. Which is what many Christians have been doing. Over the years, God's given me a great hunger just to study up on this, this thing called revival. And Dr. Edwin J. Orr from California, uh, who's done more research on revival than any man that's ever... He's written about 12, maybe 14 books now on the subject of revival. He has studied every revival that ever happened anywhere in the world. And we've been corresponding together. He's asked me to go to England with him a number of times to do research on revival. I don't know if I'll ever get there or not. I don't know why he wants me. I told him, I said, look, with all these big intellectual lights you have working with you, I don't know why he wants me along. Well, he says, we need some enthusiasts as well as some intellectuals. Well, that's fine. But anyway, he's writing these books on revival. And you know, you read these stories and and your heart just melts as you see what God can do. But then your heart breaks when you see how little is happening today in North America, where there are, for example, 28 million people who call themselves Baptists. Did you know that? 28 million people in North America call themselves Baptists? If even half of those people were filled with the Spirit of God, we would rock the world. Rock the world. But there's this terrible discrepancy between the ideal and the actual, as we see it in the Word of God tonight. What is the actual? There's a verse in Jeremiah chapter 9 that says, They go, they proceed from evil to evil. Slipping and sliding, slowly downward, getting colder and colder, deader and deader, more critical and harder and all the rest of it. This is the the story of many people. You know, a fellow in a very large evangelical church in Western Canada, a choir director in the church, said to me one day, and I didn't realize at the time it was a cry for help, because this was before revival, and some things, many things I didn't know then, many things I'm sure I still don't know, but at that time I never had the experience. I see now it was a cry for help. He said, Bill, you know all these texts in the Bible about the abundant Christian life? He said, they sure don't work out for me. He said, frankly, the older I get, the more corrupt I become. Do you know something? Not long after that, he forsook his wife, ran away with a young girl from the church, disappeared in eastern Canada somewhere. I just heard a few months ago he's in eternity now. I can see him yet saying, the older I get, the more corrupt I become. Now that's sad. What about, I mean, why? Isn't God giving? Isn't God blessing? 
What is the reason? Well, sometimes people have said to me, Okay, Brother Bill, Romans chapter 7, the Apostle Paul said, Oh, wretched man that I am. And you know, I'm wretched like Paul was, you know. I'm just being scriptural. And I say, okay, let's look at the scripture then. Oh, wretched man that I am. Now let's go on. Who shall deliver me from this body of death? Let's go on. I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. You see, people have a tendency to take certain parts of Scripture out and not look at the whole thing. And like I said last night, a text taken of its context becomes a pretext for low living. And there's a high cost for low living. All right? So then people say, well, it was only meant for the apostolic age, like the book of Acts. That was just meant for the apostolic age. Then you have to answer this. The Lord Jesus Christ said, I'm going to send you another comforter that he may abide with you until the last apostle dies. Is that what he said? No. He said that he may abide with you forever. Forever. And how long is that? All right, that's what he said. Then some people say, well, once the Canaan of Scripture was completed and we had a, the complete revelation in printed form, uh, the Bible, the 66 books of the Bible, then we didn't need all those miraculous elements we find in the book of Acts. Now, when I talk about the miraculous elements in the book of Acts, I'm not talking about those things out in the periphery like, you know, the tongues experience and the shaking of the buildings and all these, uh, you know, the, the attendant phenomena that went on. I'm not talking about those things. Don't ever mistake the attendant phenomena for the real thing. I mean, those things happened, I believe it, but this is not where the action is. I remember a couple in, in the States, down in Denver, Colorado, she had had the tongues experience. Do you know what she and her husband told me? She said it, and he was there listening. She said, tongues is not where the action is. She said, the action is, listen carefully, the action is where the cross is. And she's right. The action is where the cross is. Except a kernel of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abides alone. Tongues or no tongues. Gift of prophecy or healing or no. Now, I am not running down any genuine spiritual gift. I'm just pointing out something, that there are more important things. Anyway, some people say, well, it was only needed until we had a completed Bible. Then I ask this question, okay, so what about the 2,000 tribes today that still don't have any part of the Bible, not even one book of the Bible, in their own language? Shouldn't we then expect that these miracles should still occur among those people? And right away they're in a quandary. They never thought about that. As a matter of fact, you know, for centuries after the Canaan of Scripture was completed, there was probably not more than five Christians in a hundred that could read. And if you could read, there wouldn't be one Christian in a hundred hundred that had the Bible. You know, the printing press was not invented for a long while after the Canaan of Scripture. For centuries, hundreds of years after the Canaan of Scripture was completed. And in fairly recent times, and by that I mean within the last 300 years, if you lived in jolly old England, enlightened as it was and all that kind of thing, if you were the two people out of a hundred that could read, and you want to read the Bible, you'd have to go down to the village church, and you'd have to get special permission to read the Bible, which would likely be chained to the pulpit, and the curate would stand there and watch you while you read for ten minutes at a time. No, that's not an argument either. So what are we going to have to do with the problem? We're going to have to look at it square in the face. Do you know what the problem is? The problem is sin, S-I-N. Is that what the Bible says? Yes, it is. For example, God said, turn and I'll pour out my spirit unto you. If I'm not willing to turn, when God reproves and rebukes me for sin, he will not pour out his spirit upon me. If I'm not willing to repent of my sins, God won't pour his spirit out. It's as simple as that. I will yet praise thee more and more, David said in Psalm 71. But some people are grumbling and complaining more and more. And the fault is not God. He hasn't turned the taps off. I heard about some place where the water wouldn't come through the water pipes, and they got the water pipes apart, they found a big old frog in the water pipes. Nobody knew how the thing got there. You know, a big old frog called self gets stuck in the pipe sometimes, and, uh, you know, the blessing doesn't flow. A frog is cold, and so is self. It's a good illustration, I think. 
And I have to speak for myself as well. When I think back, dear people, do you mind if I shared you something here? I've got this many books in the Holy Spirit in my library, read them all, read some of them more than once, and many, many books in revival and prayer and related themes. And I read them by the hour. I read the Bible through and through and through and through again. I made copious notes in the Bible. I went through the Bible one time and made notes on every prayer in the Bible. I cataloged them under the four headings you find. First Timothy chapter 2, you know, uh, prayers, supplication, intercession, giving of thanks, and all this kind of thing. I used to take whole nights. I'd fast. I'd pray. I'd try to pray whole nights through that God would fill me with the Holy Spirit. You know what I was trying to do? I was trying to overcome God's reluctance when I should have been trying to lay hold of God's willingness. The problem was not with God. Prayer is not to change God. Prayer is to change me. To bring me to the point where God can safely do what he always wanted to do. And to be perfectly honest, now those nights when I tried to pray through, I normally fell asleep about 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning, woke up my knees at 5 o'clock or something, felt quite ashamed, dived into bed and didn't try again for another couple of months when the pressure got so bad, I'd try again. And it went on for years. Until one night, in sheer desperation, I faced Galatians 2.20. I am crucified with Christ. And I told the Lord, I said, I'm tired of going into Galatians 2.20 and tumbling out the other side like Eutychus fell out that window in the book of Acts. I said, God, I'm going to go into this by faith and I am never coming out. And the next day I could see a difference in my life. And uh, not more than a couple of months later, one night, the Lord came to me and in a very sweet and beautiful way, he filled my life with the Holy Spirit. And then I knew the difference. God was just waiting for me to deal with sin himself. That's all. He would have blessed me way back if I had understood this. There didn't seem to be much literature that said anything about it. And I didn't understand some of these things in the Bible. All right. Then here's a thought. You know, in Job chapter 20, uh, there's a thought there. He's talking about the hypocrite and secret sin. And he's likening secret sin to a candy that a person has in their mouth. And he's talking about the person enjoying the sweet morsel and rolling it under their tongue. Okay? So you've got this sweet candy in your mouth and it's really nice and nobody else knows you've got it and you're sucking on it and you're enjoying it. But that's secret sin. You know what he says? He says, that man will suck the poison of the asp and the viper's tongue will slay him. The tongue of the devil. And then he says this. He shall not see the rivers, the floods, the brooks of honey and butter. Our text, he that believes on these, the scripture said, out of his innermost being shall flow rivers of living water. The hypocrite, the person with secret sin in his life, will not see the rivers, the floods, or the brooks of honey and butter. The Hebrew there says the screaming brooks. He will never see. So secret sin may be the problem. Here's something else. In John chapter 4, Jesus Christ talked about the info of the Spirit of God. He said, if you drink of this water, drink as well, you'll thirst again. We understand that. He said, but whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst, but the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. An artesian well. Dr. Reuben Torrey used to say, you don't have to go looking for it, you've got it inside you. A well of water springing up, getting higher and higher and higher until we walk over someday and be with the Lord forever. Uh, that's the inflow of the Spirit of God. Now the outflow of the Spirit of God is in John chapter 7. There's an outflow, then if I'm filled with the Spirit of God, there ought to be an outflow of blessing you see to other people. And one major reason why many Christians are never filled with the Spirit of God is because they're all concerned about the inflow and they're not concerned about the outflow. They want to be filled with the Spirit of God with all the attendant phenomena they can lay their hands on, but they're not really concerned even about their neighbor's salvation. So they are never filled with the Spirit of God. God will not fill people with the Spirit just to make them happy. I find over and over again, here's a little study I made one time, as I noticed it looked significant, I followed it through and it was significant, that almost always in the, in the Bible, almost always, when people are filled with the Holy Spirit, the next thing says, and they spoke. They had something to say for God. And if I want to be filled with the Holy Spirit so I'll have something to say for God to the unconverted neighbors and people I work with and so on, oh, it may not be very long, shouldn't be very long, other things being equal and my understanding of the doctrine all until I'm filled with the Spirit of God. You know the difference between the Sea of Galilee and the Dead Sea? They're both fed by the same river. But the Sea of Galilee has an outflow as well as an inflow and the Dead Sea doesn't have an outflow, just an inflow and it's getting deader by the day. 
There's not one fish inside that sea. You can actually sit up in the water. It's so salty now and read a newspaper. You won't sink. You can't do that in the Sea of Galilee. There's as many fish in the Sea of Galilee today as there was 1,900 years ago. So there's an outflow, and there has to be an outflow in my life. Otherwise, why am I praying to be filled with the Spirit of God? For selfish reasons, vain reasons, self-reasons, many, many times. People want God to, you know, to fill that old self, to glorify self, like Saul. You remember Saul said, I have sinned, yet honor me now. He said to, to, to Samuel the prophet, honor me now, not honor God, honor me. And God won't go along with any self-glorification program I don't care how nicely it's wrapped and how nicely it's presented. He will not do that. Self has to die. So the Lord Jesus Christ can live and shine out through my life. Maybe there's no faith. Maybe there's no asking. God said ask. Some people don't ask. Ask and it shall be given you. Seeking you shall find. Knock and it shall be uh, opened unto you. The problem, dear people, is always, the problem is always in here. You know, I read the, Oh, I guess it was about ten years or whatever ago. I read a book. It was a story of a great revival that began among Indian people in Lake Winnipeg, Norway House in northern Manitoba. And the missionary towels were back about the time of the Welsh revival, 1906 or 7 or something. And the missionary tells how he got so discouraged with what was going on. They win people to the Lord and then they'd be back in their debauchery within a week. And it got so dis- discouraging, you know. And finally he got to praying, Oh God, revive these people. Revive them. Pour out your spirit. Do something. And then he says in the book, and one night, God revived me. And then the revival started among the Indians, and hundreds were converted. Now, the book was written in 1926, and the author of the book said, the only Indians in northern Manitoba that we know of today that are walking with God are Indians that were converted in that revival back in 1906. But the thing that spoke to me was this, why did God have to fill the missionary first of all? Wasn't he the missionary, the man who gave up family and friends and home and all the comforts and everything else to go up there in the bush and eat bannock and jackfish and be eaten alive by black flies and mosquitoes? I mean, hadn't he given up a lot? Oh, yes. Do you know something about self? Self will read the Bible and pray and tithe its income and go to Bible school or seminary and it will go and live in the jungle for 40 years. It will do almost anything but die. We've had missionaries come and say we can't go back to the foreign field. There's just no blessing in our hearts. Unless God does something for us, we are not going back. Because they have seen, although it might look like we're making a great sacrifice to go to foreign land, we might make a sacrifice, but not that sacrifice of self, which is absolutely essential, whether it's there or here. The text then says, Jesus Christ said, He that believes on me, as the scripture has said, out of his innermost being shall flow rivers of living water. And we're talking tonight about a tragic discrepancy. How is it in your life? Are you filled with God's spirit? Is his spirit flowing out through you? If the answer is no, would you ask the further question, Dear God, show me why. And he gave us a prayer to pray in Psalm 139, 23, and 24. The prayer is this. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts and see if there be any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. And just before we close, might I say this? You loan me your ears. You don't know your own problems. You just think you do. You don't know what God is saying unless you've asked God to show you the sin in your heart and life. A lot of people are fooled here. I know a couple went home from a revival meeting and they sat down and they said, Honey, I'm concerned. Maybe we're not filled with the Holy Spirit as we ought to be. So he says, I'll tell you what to do. He says to his wife, honey, you tell me. Be absolutely honest and tell me. I don't care what you say. It isn't going to crush me. You tell me. And you see anything wrong in my life. And she spoke up and said, no, I don't. She said, you're an ideal husband. You're a perfect, uh, you know, gentleman, father, Christian, all the rest of it, you know. And she said, I just, I can't see anything wrong. So then she said, now you tell me about myself. He said, well, honey, I feel the same. He said, you're perfect. I mean, he said, you know. So you know what? They concluded they were both filled with the Spirit of God. When I heard the story, I knew the couple. I said to myself, I wonder what would have happened if they had gotten down on their knees and said, Lord, search me, O God, and know my heart, try me and know my thoughts. If they'd asked God to show them, then the story's different. 
I've talked with people. I remember a man came one night and he said, Brother Bill, I want so, I want so much to enter into an overcoming Christian life. But he said, you know, I've been searching my heart and I can't find anything that's wrong there. He said, why won't God fill me with the Holy Spirit? Well, I said, have you ever asked him to show you? He said, no. I said, why don't we get down and pray? And so he did. And dear people, I'll guarantee that God showed him at least 12 different things in his life that were wrong. After he prayed the prayer, search me, O God, and he waited, and the Holy Spirit began to work, and I heard him confessing this, and confessing that, and confessing something else, and on and on it went. He was not aware of them, but the Holy Spirit was, and God was willing to show him when he was willing to pray this honest prayer. 